everybody. Dave Meltzer here for the next two hours. We're going to be talking pro wrestling, and we are going to have Van Piero up in about a half an hour, so uh, that is confirmed. And uh, Brian, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. Okay, that's cool. We've got, uh, got a ton of news to talk about. We're going to get right into the news. First off, uh, Nicole Bass is hospitalized with pancreatitis. Um, uh, so it's really bad. Um, and she's in the intensive care unit right now, so just wanted to bring that up. Uh, let me see what else. Uh, just really a lot. Um, SACW will talk a little bit about that. They actually did announce a pay-per-view card for Sunday, which we'll get to in just a second. And uh, the December 21st show in Queens has been moved to December the 15th. The reason it was moved up was because they would have no television for the December 23rd weekend unless they had a show. You know, they couldn't get it done on the 21st for the 23rd, so they basically need to move it up. And Dudley's will still be appearing on that show. Jerry Lynn is um, in the building, I believe, right as we speak, at the, at the uh, Target Center in Minneapolis, where or wherever... Uh, wherever I think it's Target Center. It's in the Twin Cities where WF's doing SmackDown. Um, likely to discuss a contract and likely to be going to the WWF. Um, the belief is is that he is going to work the pay-per-view on Sunday. Uh, so it'll be a three-way in the main event. Just incredible. Steve Carino and uh, Jerry Lynn for the title. Let me look at the other stuff. That uh, Doring and Roadkill in the FBI for the tag team titles. Rhino against Spike Dudley. Uh, Tommy Dreamer against C.W. Anderson, Simon Diamond and Swinger against Christian York and Joey Matthews, Super Crazy and Question Mark against uh, Tajiri and Mikey Whipwreck. So um, that's they're doing the angle where Doring and Roadkill split up if they lose, right? Um, I don't even know. Are they? Yeah, I think they are. Okay, that's interesting. Did not even know that. Let me write that down. Okay. Uh, Uh, let's see, what other stuff we got here? Uh, poll. This was a really bad poll for WCW. Uh, what did you think about the Mayhem pay-per-view? 11% up, 12% down, 8% in the middle, which actually is not that negative of a response. Uh-oh. 69% didn't see the show. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. And you know, the worst th- part is, is looking at Starcade already, it's rematches, and it's new matches that I don't know why anybody would want to see them. I know. I would say, with that kind of a number, I would think the buy rate's got to be in the .10 range. Mm-hmm. Oh, boy. Oh, boy, they need they need help in a hurry. Uh, let's see, okay, today's poll question is, what do you think of Monday Night's Wrestling? A, Raw was better. B, Nitro was better. C, didn't watch Raw. D, didn't watch Nitro. E, didn't watch Raw or Nitro. Uh, before we get into Raw and Nitro, I want to make a couple notes. Um, the Armageddon pay-per-view on the 10th, the two top matches are going to be a Hell in a Cell match, for the WF title with Kurt Angle, Steve Austin, Rikishi, Triple H, Rock, and Undertaker. So that's how they're doing it. Does that sound like uh, a disaster to you, or is it just me? Uh, I was very negative towards when I heard that, and maybe it'll be changed. I think that the angle will be shot tonight, and maybe, again, it's not official until it's announced officially. But, um, it's just but so that hard was... because they set a standard with everyone except that boss man Undertaker match that... Someone has somebody, to do a crazy bump or something like that, and none somebody of those has to, guys are going to do it. Somebody has to go off the roof. That's exactly what I thought. That, that was my thoughts exactly. And the I other problem is you got six guys in there, and whenever you have a six, you know, a six-person match or whatever, tornado match, at least there's the opportunity where some of the guys can brawl in the crowd. Some of the guys maybe can brawl up by the ramp. They're going to be in a cage, and they're all going to be stuck in there together. And what can you do? The other thing is the six ways never draw. You know, they did a six way, and it, uh, last year. Um, and it was the lowest buy rate of the whole year. It's, 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 it's like there's no... When you're throwing a six people in there, there's not enough personal issues to make you want to go out of your way to buy the show. Yeah. And, and they're going to go Billy... I think it's draw just because they're saying it's going to be hell in the cell, and I think there's a lot of fans that might actually think that something big might happen there, but I think in the end they'll just end up disappointed. Yeah. And then Billy Gunn, Chris Benoit for the Intercontinental title, which will probably be set up a little bit. It was set up a little bit last night. Uh, probably be set up a little bit more tonight. They're going to do, uh, was it Kane and Chris Benoit against uh, Billy Gunn and... Uh, who's Billy Gunn's partner? I don't even have it off the top of my head. Uh, Chris Jericho. Uh, Billy Gunn and China, by the way, have, are split up. Um, and it's just one of those things that... Uh, I don't know I don't know what it is, but everything that we talk about, it happens like the next week. It's the weirdest thing. Except they um, go beating people. 
<laughs> no, because he beat Undertaker. It just took ten people oh, to yeah. help him. He sure did. And uh, actually, I thought Undertaker. I mean, um, Kurt Angle and Steve Austin was a pretty good match last night. Yeah, it was pretty uh, good. I don't okay. know why he couldn't beat him. No, Steve Austin's not doing any jobs now. He has to soon, though. I don't think he should. I wouldn't even book Austin doing any jobs till WrestleMania. I, I don't. I don't have a problem with that. I really don't. Um, but eventually, he's going to have to start doing jobs. Let's see. Uh, Starcade. For the 17th, let me go through this. Steiner and Sid Vicious for the title. Good Lord. Good Lord. Is that sad or what? You know, it's really scary because Steiner hurt Goldberg and he hurt Booker T. And last time Steiner and Goldberg had a match on a pay-per-view, they almost killed each other. And I would guess that Goldberg is a lot tougher guy than Sid, who I would kind of appears guess. fragile. He's always injured. He's always hurt. And I'm just afraid about what's going to happen in that match. Either yeah. they're going to throw each other around and Sid's going to get killed, or they're not going to do anything at all. It's going to be uh, Luger versus Goldberg Part Two, which will make for a hideous match. Well, it's going to be hideous anyway because because Sid Sid's got to have a, a ton of ring rust. Yep. And he stinks anyway. He had ring rust when he was working every night. That's what I mean. He stinks, and now the other thing is, is he's 41 years old. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, so I don't know. Goldberg and Luger. And it's just like, geez, that match was so horrible. You know, why would anyone want to see it again? And the ref did get speared, but it wasn't like they called for a DQ and there was a lot of controversy. It was something that they mentioned the next night. And if you watch the pay-per-view, which actually nobody did, so it doesn't matter, but (laughs) Goldberg beat him clean. So what's the point of having a rematch? How'd you like like, uh, all the hype on that three-count match? Oh, yeah, okay. And, uh... Four of these six men jobbed. One of the men was not even on TV. And now he was the best of the six. I know. <laughs> he was the star of the whole card. And they didn't even do nothing with him. Well, they did give Young Yang a win over Lance Storm. Uh, by the way, Lance Storm hurt himself again last night. Well, that's so he, shocking. He, so, well... He work injured and get hurt. Yeah, so he, he is going to take some time off now. He's going to be appearing on all the TVs, but I don't think he's going to be wrestling for a couple weeks. Uh, let's see. Okay, then there's going to be, um, let's see. Three-way for the tag team title, Paige and Nash, Stacey I can Palumbo, and Chronic. Oh, I mean, <laughs> like, oh, oh, what can I say? Uh, Mike, o- Mike Awesome against Bam Bam Bigelow. Um, this was originally supposed to be Conan and Jeff Jarrett. has now been switched to Conan, Rey Mysterio Jr., and um, Kidman against Jeff Jarrett and the Harris Twins. Jarrett got that one switched, which means that the Filthy Animals break up um, that was actually, I think it was actually supposed to happen last night, is probably not going to happen until after this pay-per-view, and maybe won't even happen at all now. Um, let's see, then it's uh, General Rection against Shane Douglas for the U.S. title, uh, Cat against Lance Storm, so those are the matches that we're aware of so far. That sounds like the most horrible card. Well, let's see, let's see. Uh, Cat and Lance Storm sounds bad. I don't think those two would work together well. Douglas and Rection... Mm, it won't stink. I don't think. Conan, Kidman, against Jarrett and Harris Twins. Uh, I don't think it'll stink, but I don't think it'll be good. Awesome Bigelow. Uh, Bigelow's got his working shoes on, maybe. The three-way tag match. Oh, that one looks real bad on paper. Uh, let's talk about... I guess we should talk about Nitro. And we'll talk about Thunder in a few minutes as well. What do you think about Nitro? I thought both Nitro and Raw were just... Kind of boring. I mean, nothing happened. I enjoyed Raw. Really? Um, yeah, it was all right. I mean, yeah, I thought it was all right. I mean, I mean, nothing really wrong with it, but nothing happened. It was kind of boring, and I thought the main event was all right, but I don't know. Just I really thought the, 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 to do it. I thought the match with the Hardys was pretty good too. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a weird match, though. Yeah. I think that um, we would be in the minority as far as liking that with the general population. Why do you say that? Hey, it's being on Jeff Hardy. He worked on his. Was his arm? Yeah, see, I, li- I, I, I like. I like. Yeah, I like that though. Yeah, it was good, but it's not what the fans probably expect from a Hardy's match. Yeah, but you can't. They can't do that anymore. I know. So it's, it's you know. I think it's uh, smart the way they're doing it, but you know, it's just like the Hell in the Cell. You set the standard with the Hardys, and all of a sudden you're grounding Jeff Hardy in every single match, working over his shoulder, or his leg, and I just don't see fans getting to that. I think on the Nitro when it was over, was I had like. So many questions. I I don't understand. I don't understand anything that's going on there. Um, you know, just one, one thing after another. Um, 
just as an example, um, um, the in the uh, well, let me let me start from the beginning. Um, they had Scott Steiner did an interview and brought up Rock and Austin, and it just it just seemed so weird. And Ric Flair's going, this man I'm flying in is at the level of those two men. And then it's Sid. <laughs> it's Sid. I know. It's just like, poor Rick. You know, and then Rick, Rick had to get over, like, um... And Rick also kind of, he didn't really say it outright, but he kind of offhandedly made the remark that this man that's coming in is at a level above everybody in WCW. Oh, and the other thing is, it's like, Steiner in his promo, he just goes, I've injured Booker T, I've injured Sting, and Goldberg's afraid to fight me. And to me, and then when Goldberg doesn't come out, it's like, what does that make Goldberg? Afraid to fight him. Yeah, there was a lot of discussion last night at the show that they do not know how to book baby faces, which is interesting because they don't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they don't. They don't. One example after another. I mean, we talked about it yesterday. We'll talk about it again today. Uh, let's see. Um, what else? Uh, Jimmy the Hart. was all right. Loco and Cage against two count. Yeah, it was good. It was good. It was a good match, I thought. Um... I thought Lance Storm and Yun Yang was a little sloppy, but it wasn't terrible. Mm-hmm. Um, the Alex Wright match, that wasn't that good. The Paige and Nash's interview. Got any comments on Paige and Nash's interview? Uh, Scott Hall's got to be coming back. He's not. I mean, he's really not. I just don't so, get it, then. Uh, they basically, dare, they're daring the company to do anything. I think Nash, Nash is trying to get himself fired. Which may not be that that intelligent to do, unless there's something on the other side that I'm not aware of. I think Page, does, you know, Page figures if he gets himself fired, it's you know they just figure that the, they're never going to be disciplined. Okay, I think it's a given. So they figure they'll just do whatever they want. And um, quite frankly, for Nash and Page as a team, they can't get over because everyone wants Hall. So Page's only way is to like use Scott Hall for the you know Scott Hall for the rub and say, well, I used to be part of them. And Nash, the only way he can get over, because no one cares about him, is to be talking about Scott Hall, and he can get over that way. So they're basically using that. I mean, it, was the, it was the strangest thing. Afterwards, um, it's really a bad idea, too, to be doing this on TV. If, if, you know, even if you want to get fired or whatever, and you think that if that happens, you'll end up in the WWF, by going on TV and saying things against the script and getting fired, it's not like the WWF going to look at you and go, that is a model employee. Let's bring them in immediately. Yeah. Um, I mean... It wasn't, as best I can tell, I mean, I know, it it wasn't on the script, but the, how would I say this? The people who are doing the script can't say that. You know why they can't say that? Because it would be forced, it it would then be forced, because those guys were all warned that they can't say anything about Scott Hall anymore, and they did, that now they really have to discipline him, and they won't. So now it's just like, (laughs) no one knows what to do. Um, I would just not allow those guys to do live interviews. Yeah. Screw it. You know, I'm. You know, but they they've given up on trying to run a, a TV show that makes sense a long time ago. But and this is a perfect example. I was watching it going like, I guess they must be bringing Scott Hall back. And then afterwards, it's, I was based. I was told last night that there is less chance because of the accident and everything of him coming back than there's ever been. And those guys went into business for themselves. And and then I go well, then what's going to happen? And it's like well, the script writers have to pretend that nothing went wrong because if they do, they're going to be forced to put their foot down, and they won't. So it's just going to be forgotten. I think. Hmm. Anyway, we'll find out. I we'll find out if they give him a live mic next Monday, which they probably won't. They'll probably give him one tonight. No, what am I? <laughs> what am I saying? Of course they will. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, Goldberg's winning streak. Nobody cares about it. It went from 14 to 20 to 26 with two wins. That was pretty good. Um, I don't even know why they even do it. And Goldberg himself like thinks the whole thing's a joke. So you can't blame that one on Goldberg. I mean, he did an interview, which actually is going to be up on the website in the next day or two. Uh, on the Wrestling Observer website, where he just, you know, he admits that the streak's not working and, you know, that no one takes it seriously. And, and he thinks that by doing this streak, it ruins the first streak in its own way. Mm-hmm. Well, it does. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Jarrett and Rey Mysterio Jr. Okay, here's the thing. You got Jarrett four looks people. totally lost. Okay. They, they didn't work well together, but they took four guys. Okay, they have four guys on Jarrett. Jarrett still gets every one of his winning moves in. Uh, he, you know, Mysterio has to be saved time after time. Jarrett keeps making comebacks. I mean, Jeff Jarrett worked as a total babyface. And then at the end, you know, I kind of thought it was funny at the end when Jarrett got DQ'd after those guys kept interfering. I thought that was sort of humorous. But 
come to find out that the original finish was supposed to be a pin, and it's just guys just, you know, oh. you know what that means. Um, before we start talking about Raw and Thunder, uh, I've got to ask you about Scott Steiner and Stevie Ray. You know, as a story, as a story, I thought that that was a nice story, building up and all that, and then the match, even though I didn't and expect the a good rang, match. as they say. When the match started, boy, did that fall. Oh, was that, what can I say? Stevie Ray often makes fun of people in the commentary booth for getting blowed up, as he says. <laughs> and he was so blowed up in that match, when he went to do that kick and could not even get his leg up, and Scott Steiner had to reach down and grab his leg for him and lift it up, I thought, we are really seeing something special here. And we were. That, that was an unbelievable match, and not in a good way. Okay, we'll go I to... I uh, watched the uh, Scott Norton versus... Uh, Steve Williams. Yes, that was... Uh, quite hideous as well, and it was actually even worse than Scott Steiner and Stevie Ray. Yeah, it was. Because they didn't blow up and they were missing spots. But I think that Scott Steiner and Stevie Ray it was that is that Steiner's kind of um, get, gets tired too easy because he's too big, and Stevie Ray just hasn't wrestled in a while, so he's out of shape. Mm-hmm. So he got so he got tired. With Williams and Norton, I think it was total lack of cooperation from Norton. Yeah, I think I think he just didn't. He was mad about doing the job and just. And, you know, and, and Williams needs help to have a good match anyway. And he didn't get any help at all. That match to me was just really sad. What, the Williams match? Yeah. It was horrid. Uh, let's see. Ames, Iowa. Raw. Uh, we talked about a couple of things. Undertaker and Kane match wasn't any good. Um, you know, when they did that angle early in the show where uh, Kurt Angle talked to Kane and talked to him about coming over for Christmas and everything like that, and Kane ends up attacking the Undertaker, I was fearing that this would lead to a match between the two somewhere down the road, and then it happened like a half hour later. Hey, better now than on pay-per-view. Yeah, they're I guess both, so. <laughs> Except they're both in the pay-per-view. Oh, no, wait. Is Kane in the pay-per-view main event? Where's Kane? Oh, Kane's probably going to have to work with Jericho again. Yep. Oh, that's nice to know. Uh, let's see. And, um, I thought the Hollies match wasn't too bad. I thought it was pretty good. Uh, that Test does that cool high kick. Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, I thought Kurt Angle was really entertaining throughout that show. You know, I really, I think that part of what they're doing with Kurt Angle is good. I liked how he was causing trouble throughout the show and just, you know, being an ass. But then when he gets in the ring, he's got to beat anybody. I don't yeah. really, I don't even care now who it is. I would even, if he beat Crash Holly on Raw, I'd at least be happy. But well, I'm but even reading like house show reports and he can't even beat Chris Jericho unless Kane runs in and chokeslams Jericho. Yes. He's just pinned somebody. Um, well, it'll probably be Jericho. Let's see, Dean Malenko was hitting on Lita. That set up the six-man tag. Uh, I don't know. Tiger Ali Singh and Blackman. Actually, I expected worse out of Tiger Ali Singh and Blackman. Yeah, but that was uh, that was right out of 1996 WWF that segment. Oh, oh yeah. And uh, that's pretty much it for for the show. Uh, let's talk about Thunder real quick. Uh, let's see. Open with um. Then Flair came out to do an interview. He brought out Sid, who did a really bad promo. And they brought up Eric Bischoff's name a lot. Uh, Young Dragons beat Lance Storm and Skipper. Duggan tried to interfere. The cat stopped him. I think Duggan is uh, going to split from Team Canada. In fact, they sort of teased that last night um, on, the, on the Nitro show. And I think they're going to further it on the, Raw, on the Thunder show. Luger beat Smiley. Then Goldberg did a run and chased Luger out of the building. Crowbar beat David Flair. Uh, Rexha and Shane Douglas ended up with a no contest. They did a thing where Tori Wilson does a fake injury angle, kind of like a fake pregnancy angle, and uh, she just collapses, and she's carried out. And that is a storyline reason, because um, when her contract is up, or actually not when her contract's up, because it's a many-year contract, but when the 90-day cycle is up, Tori Wilson is, in fact, being cut, because her contract is too high, and uh, she may be meeting with WWF soon. Good. Uh, And... uh, as far as they, she was making somewhere between 200 and 250. They offered her 52 to stay, and I, think she, I don't think she's going to stay for 52. I wonder what she can make. Well, what does a fitness model at her level make? Probably not a lot, I wouldn't think. I don't really think a lot, but she does everything. I mean, she's everywhere. She Everyone was everywhere. She be like in three or four magazines. Okay, she, she was everywhere. But the thing is, is that the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? The, um, the lifespan um, of someone in that profession is not particularly long. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, they move them out for new girls. You know, they got to have new hot girls every, you know, every time. So, you know, it's not a lot of longevity in, in the fitness model business. Uh, let's see. Jarrett and the Harris Twins beat the Filthy Animals. Bigelow lost to Sergeant Awell in tables match, and then Steiner beat Buff Bagwell. And Buff Bagwell threw a terrible fit at the end of that show. Off, this is off the air backstage, uh, just complaining about how horrible the company is and basically saying, you can fire me right now because I'll get a job somewhere else. And, of course, doing a basic Scott ah. Steiner imitation. And, of course, he wasn't fired. And he knew it, and that's probably why he knew he can get away with it, and that's why guys do that. And, Maybe uh, Steiner isn't even an A-level guy. Um, well, I guess. Uh, let's see what other stuff we have. Um, <laughs> oh, New Japan Tag Team Tournament uh, will end on Thursday, tomorrow, in Hiroshima. Uh, it'll be four teams. They all finish with four and two records. Takashi Zuka and Yuji Nagata. Scott Norton and Masa Chono. Can't wait to see their tag matches. Manabu Nakanishi and Yutaka Yoshie. And Hiro Yoshi Tenzan and Satoshi Kojima. No ratings today because of uh, Thanksgiving. Everything is a little bit behind. We should have tons of stuff on that tomorrow. And uh, what else? Uh, I think that's... Any, any other big news? Uh, I don't think so. S- small news? Uh, I think we've pretty much covered everything. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, pretty much. Okay, let's hit a few emails before we get Vampiro on up. Uh, let's see. This is from Joel, who says... Joel Coles wrote, who says, With the current financial trouble in WCW and no turnaround in sight for the near future, this is what I would do if I was in charge. Joel's been around a while, so I'm... Okay. Buy out Hulk Hogan, Kevin Nash, Scott Steiner, Buff Bagwell, Lex Luger, Sting, Sid Vicious, and Diamond Dallas Page with full releases. They're all dead weight. They're nothing but troublemakers. I'd restructure the talent contracts of those I'd be keeping with something similar to the WF's downside guarantees, which would lower the overall talent budget. I'd dump Vince Russo and Ed Ferrara and put Johnny Ace, Terry Taylor, and Arn Anderson in charge of booking. If the numbers would remain as they are, they would be in better financial position without the high-end contracts. True and all of the locker room dissension would be gone. The product could then be con- can concentrate on younger talent, plus they should bring in new talent like Rob Van Dam, Christopher Daniels, Shinjiro Otani, freshen up the product, all without a glass ceiling. It'll never happen, but what do you think? That's a nice dream. <laughs> uh, it's from Chris who goes, Do you think the other guys in WCW are going to be pissed off that Sid comes in after not being on TV for months and gets a main event on the biggest show of the year? And eh, they're pissed about everything anyway. Uh, this just adds to it. They're, but they do have a logical storyline for this match, and it'll be on Thunder tomorrow night. And it'll be the, they're basically going to say that you know Sid had the title taken from him in April. He never lost it when Bischoff and Russo on that show where they came in, and he had to hand over the belt. And so you know by all rights he deserves a title shot, which actually does make sense in a weird way. But but nobody cares. So from from a drawing standpoint, it doesn't matter. Uh, let's see. What are the chances of Vince McMahon buying half of ECW? If he was willing to throw several million dollars to buy WCW, why not throw a couple million dollars to ECW? With McMahon's help, ECW could quickly become the number two promotion in the United States. McMahon could help ECW get a good time slot somewhere and can book bigger arenas. This would help both parties, giving ECW a second chance of putting them in some killer cross-promotional angles. No, not the cross-promotional angles, because those would be killer uh, for ECW. Yeah. Uh, probably too good to be true. That's... I'm kind of interested in why the Dudleys are showing up at that show. Uh, be, just to do a favor for Paul. I don't know what the... Re- there's always a return when you do deal I, with, I with Vince. Kinda, I just kind of see Vince going, I could offer to buy into the company now or whatever. Or I could let it fall even further, send the Dudleys in and watch the house go way up, and then let what it the fall house? again, and pretty soon Paul will be so desperate. Yeah. Okay. The thing is, the thing is with the Dudleys, though, they're working um, an 800 seat building. I mean, Paul's going to be able to fill that building with or without the Dudleys. I know. It's but it maybe the atmosphere. Um, oh, it'll help. Uh, it'll help. It'll make the people think they're seeing something a little bit special because they're seeing WWF stars. But whenever that game gets started, I mean, that's what killed Smoky Mountain. That's. I don't. Want, I, I mean, I'm going to be too strong. That isn't what killed Smoky Mountain Wrestling because there were other things that killed Smoky Mountain. It was one of the things that killed Smoky Mountain Wrestling was when the WWF guys came in and they had to be put over and they were, came in as the big stars on the show, the people no longer spent money to buy tickets until the WWF guys came in. They didn't want to see just the Smoky Mountain guys anymore because, you know, and that will eventually happen if he continually uses WWF guys. Um, WWF is, is very willing, if, you know, Paul runs in the Northeast and, you know, in sending him to send him some talent that they don't have booked on the road because they actually have more guys now on the active roster than they can put on a, on a 10 or 11 match house show anyway. But there's always, you know, there's always like the Al Snows or, you know, whoever it is, the guys that aren't on the road. 
Uh, let's see what we have here. Uh, Vampiro is on the line. Okay, well, we, let's get to him right now. How you doing? Hello? Ian, this yeah. is Dave. Hey, Dave. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing good. How you doing, man? I'm doing really good. I'm doing really good. Um, why don't you, I guess we might as well start and update everyone as to uh, what your condition is, what you're doing, and what your plans are. Okay, listen, um, I'm about to do a concert tonight, the first one of the tour. I'm going to explain all this, but Violent J is with me, too. And he's okay. got some things oh, to say about dream. WCW. You want to get him on there, too, right away? Sure. Yes. <laughs> yeah, man, you know, we're home back today. So let's, let's do this, man. Okay. Okay, is he on? Uh, no, he'll be, he'll be, uh, I'm going to do what you said, you know, update my, my status, clarify okay. some rumors, Okay. and then uh, we got some things to say in the direction right. of uh, Mark Madden and Bob Ryder. Okay. So, we got to, you know, tell me how you, we just start, is this live or we just... We're live, we're on. Oh, you're on right now? We're on right now, oh yeah. Okay, fuck yeah, let's go. <laughs> Take the gloves okay. off. Okay. I'm sorry. Listen, uh, let's start. You said to clarify my condition. Well, my condition is this. This is what happened in Halloween Havoc. I had received a concussion that night. That was my 15th concussion of my career from the power bomb that happened with Mike Awesome off the top rope. The next day, I went to Monday Nitro, and I had told them repeatedly. I told them over six times that I'm hurt. I can't remember. I can't talk. I can't stand up. I get dizzy and I have no feeling in my fingers. They told me it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. You don't have a serious injury. Just go out there and do the match. I went out there. I took the power bomb two more times that night. So in the span of three days, I had two concussions. I, in two days, I had three concussions. I had 17 concussions now. I went home to Montreal. I don't remember how I got there. I went to the neurologist, the specialist in the hospital because before I did that, I took my baby in for a checkup when the doctor saw me and said, you better get to the hospital. I went there and they have a specialist there who works with the NFL, NBA, and NHL. This doctor told me that by the looks of things right now and the, and the verbal tests she had given me, that it looks like the speech, my speech will be impaired for the rest of my life and I will have brain damage for the rest of my life. And as I get older, it's going to start to show more and more. And even to date, a month later after Halloween Havoc, I have no memory. I have memory loss. I have to write things down when I talk to my wife or I talk to my family or my friends. I have to write down what we talked about because an hour later, I forget the details of the conversation. Um, that's basically what happened. So then I went and I took an MRI, and I haven't got the results back from that. But you yourself, Dave, you got the medical report right from the hospital yeah I did okay here's my beef here's what really bothers me right after the injury WCW didn't call me to see how I was they never called once to see how I was Bob Ryder did call me one time but it was about a week and a half after the event and I didn't speak to him he left a, a phone message on my phone but nobody from the company called they only called once to see if I they called twice they called once to see if I was faking and they called another time to see if I could still go to Germany to sign autographs. And it was like, man, I can't even hold my baby who's seven weeks old. I can't even take a shower standing up because I'm going to fall down. And you guys don't even ask me how I'm doing. So uh, I think WCW, me personally, is just fucked. And I, I was really offended by that because I put my heart and soul into pro wrestling over the last 16 years. Um, I came to WCW from Mexico. I had a lot to give. I begged on my hands and knees to work. I tried my best to make that company better. I did everything I could, and uh, they just don't want me there. They got no time for me, and I think they missed the boat on me. I think they, they, they made me out to be a jabroni. They treated me like a jobber. And, uh, you know, I, I got Chad Damiani and, and Mark Madden and Bob Ryder saying that uh, this is the biggest mistake of my life, and I got bad advice, and... and uh, I'm making mistakes, and how can I do this? And I was about to get the biggest push. Man, I heard that bullshit my whole life about getting a big push, and that's and that's not what it's about. And uh, as far as making getting bad advice, uh, getting advice from my wife and my mom and my doctor, telling me that one more landing on my head, I could be a vegetable for the rest of my life. I don't think that's bad advice at all. Making decisions that I made, 
But aside from that, uh, Violent J and, and Shaggy Two Joe Dope, I Insane Clown Posse, they treated me like a family since I first met them, and and they've accepted me into their family and they've given me a you know a chance at a new life. So I mean, like you know, fuck WCW, man. They didn't even call me to see how I was doing, and all these people saying that I'm making a big mistake and that I'm leaving all this money behind. I mean, those guys can kiss my ass. That's all they think about is money and what I can generate for them. They don't care about my well-being. And me, myself, as an artist or, or a performer, I got things to do, and I got a lot more to give, and these guys just don't want me to do it. So I had to make a decision, and the decision was real easy to make. I want my friends and my family, and this is where I want to be. So WCW is out. What now? Are, are you ruling out wrestling, or what's your thoughts as far as wrestling somewhere at some point? No, I'm definitely not ruling out wrestling. Okay. I'm definitely going to be involved in JCW when I can get the clearance from the doctor, which is going to be six to eight to nine months, and even then it's at my own risk. Uh, and hopefully, one day, just to spite WCW, and just because I can't go out like this, I didn't spend my whole life getting where I am just to let it go. If, w, if WWF comes knocking one day, I'll be there in a heartbeat just because I think WCW blew it and I just want to shove it up their ass. So, yeah, I would go in a heartbeat to WWF. But right now, I'm playing bass for the Insane Clown Posse on the Bizarre Bizarre Tour, working on my own album. We got movie projects. We got a tour booked in Mexico for the next JCW tape. I mean, I got a lot going on. So I'll do, I'm probably going to do independent shows. Uh, because I want to make it fun again, so I'm definitely not ruling out wrestling. I'm just definitely ruling out WCW. Um, what as far as um your tenure in WCW? I mean, it's hello, no different. Yeah, hello. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yeah, are you? Are we on live? We're on live. Hang on, man. I gotta pass to somebody. Okay. Hello. Hello there. This is Violent J. Hey, Violent J, how you doing? I think that uh, the, the recent concussions to Vampiro's head has knocked him insane. And luckily, that fits in around here in, in the ICP camp. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he's definitely insane. How you guys doing? We're doing really good. Cool. I wanted to come on here to say one thing only, because I'm not much of the uh, wrestling legend that Vampiro is. And I'm not much of uh, anything in the world of wrestling, and I know that. But the one thing I do want to clarify is that uh, Mark Madden and um, Bob Ryder and a couple other people from WCW that are the journalists, if you will, are the guys that are saying that uh, Vampiro made a huge mistake in, um, you know, however they view it. But the one mistake he didn't make was an economic mistake. He is not losing money to come play bass for the Insane Clown Posse. And that's what I'm upset about because when I call the WCW hotline and I read those reports on the internet, I hear people stating it as fact that Vampiro left behind a world of money to come with us. And the fact is, I would say he makes almost twice as much with us as he is, and that's per year, as he is with WCW. Because he's not only playing bass for the insane clown policy, that, that is not what he left WCW for. He left WCW for a career in music. And what that is, is my record company, which is Psychopathic Def Jam, we have signed Vampiro to a five-album deal, which can keep him busy in the music industry for the next ten years, if you want. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So he did not leave behind money. Did he leave behind a mistake, a future in wrestling? I don't know. Nobody knows that. I mean, it, it did, well, not wrestling, but did he leave a future, a prominent future in WCW? Nobody knows that. Did he leave behind a, a future world title run? Nobody really knows that for sure. But one thing he did not leave behind was a, a large amount of money because, in fact, he's making more money with us, with Psychopathic Records, with Island Records. And it's not... Everybody is saying that he left to play bass for the Insane Clown Posse. That is all he's doing for the next three months on this tour. But, in fact, he left for a career in music. And he's not. he didn't leave anything. He left WCW. That, now, as everybody knows, that still leaves the whole world of wrestling open for him. But what it sets me is when I hear things like the WCW hotline saying, oh, Vampiro is out of his mind because he left uh, uh, all this money and a great future in WCW. And the fact is, he has a family and he's a businessman just like all of us. He's going to do what's going to make him more money and, and, and give him the freedom as a man, as an adult. And at the time, it was to come 
and join the music world of uh, Def Jam Psychopathic. You know what I mean? So I just wanted to clear that up as a fact. He's not leaving behind all this money. In fact, he's making more money with us. And I, I, well, I can break it down how you want. You know what I'm saying? I can break it down for the for the uh, amount. Why don't you? Why don't you do that? Well, what what it is is you got live shows that, that he's making. He's making more money per live show with us than he did with WCW. If you break that down, and we play five nights a week. WCW plays right now. They they, they 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 do like what two nights a week? Maybe a house show, and they film their Thunder and their Nitro on the same night. Am I right now? Yeah, they, they, they do, do one a week. They do one doing, a week. They're, they're doing five to seven shows a month. It looks like. Okay, well we we've got we've got at least twenty twenty three shows a month. You know what I mean? We get like one day off a week, and uh, per per shows, Vampiro was making. If you broke it down, what he makes a year. He was making this, this, I don't want to discuss Van Peele's money, I'll leave him to do that, but he was making this and this much money per show at WCW, he's making twice that with us, and that's just him playing live. His record advance was well into six figures, you know what I'm saying? I'm going to say it was over $500,000. If he wants to give the, the uh, advance that he's made with us, that's fine, you know what I mean? But that breaks down to every album he releases, it goes up. He's doing very, very good, he got a very giant record deal, and the fact is, the music business might be just being somewhere at a good time and who you know and, and a lot of luck, but it's the same way with wrestling, you know what I mean? There's a lot of people that are on top of the world that basically probably shouldn't, you know what I mean? There's a lot of great athletes that just haven't been discovered yet. Well, it's the same way. Van Pure happens to be a great musician, and nobody ever knew that. But if you come out to any one of the dates on the upcoming Bizarre Bizarre Tour, you'll see him. He's a, he even has a part where he plays a solo bass and it's, it's unbelievable. I didn't know he could do that. When I was in WCW, he told me he played bass, and I was like, blah, blah, blah. You know, I, I didn't know that he actually had that kind of talent. We became better friends. We started hanging out on our time off. He came to the studio, started playing on our, on our started playing around in the studio. Next thing you know, we cut a, a demo, a three-song demo of Vampiro sent it to our record label. The record company was in shock. Aside of the fact that he's a star in the wrestling world, you're looking at a six-foot-five, 250 pound monster you know what I'm saying which is easily as hell to market the music business you know the way people look now with your Marilyn Manson's your insane clown posse and so on he's got this dreadlocked monster that also speaks Spanish which means you can hit all those markets it's just he's a great marketing tool for music you know and music's a lot like wrestling it's a, it's a lot about gimmicks now you know we paint our faces and jump around on stage you know Slipknot wears rubber masks and jumps around on stage. It's a, lot, it's a lot about how you look in music today, you know, and the kind of music we do. And I think everybody's going to be in shock when they hear Vampiro's record. I think everybody's going to be in shock when they see that he's not just chasing some dream and leaving behind money and leaving behind a future. He, he in fact, has the future wide open. As soon as his concussion's cleared up and he's able to wrestle again, he can go anywhere he wants. I, I, I think I think he can go to WWF. I think they want him. He's young. He's a great talent. And uh, like I said, I don't really know much about the, the wrestling world, but as far as music and people saying he made a mistake and left behind a mountain of money, I think that that's pretty bad journalism because before you should do some journalism, you should check your facts. The facts are he's making almost twice the amount with, uh, with, with Psychopathic uh, Def Jam than he was with wrestling. And you're talking about some other projects like a movie deal and stuff like that. What um, what exactly we, are you doing there? We have a movie deal with, with Island Films where we have to produce uh, a movie every year. We have to give a movie to Island every year. And these movies go straight to home video, and that's at our request because uh, it's a lot more money to be made for us straight to home video. I think where Insane Clown Posse is, if we released a movie in the theaters, I don't think our band is big enough where we'd make any money. In fact, they would lose money. Yet on home videos, they go platinum. So Vampiro is, is, has a starring role in our next movie, which we begin sh shooting this summer in California. And, and, uh, so he's going to be shooting a movie for three months. He's making a lot of money from that. You know what I mean? There's so many different things he's making money from. You know, We've got uh, his action figures coming out. Now, WCW, I don't, I don't have a clue of what they pay their uh, wrestlers for oh, action yes, figures and things like that for merchandise. However, for, for, for the action figures we're putting out of Vampiro and the merchandise he makes every night in concert, it's monstrous compared to what they're making there. You know what I mean? And that's fact. And I invite anybody to come to our shows. 
I invite anybody, any wrestling journalist to come to our shows, and, I, and I'll break it down for you. I'll show you exactly how it works. I'll show you the T-shirts that, that are for sale and the exact amount of money he gets for them when he sells them. I'll show you the money he gets for wrestling dials, the money he gets for all of this stuff. And, and it just pisses me off because it sounds like... Uh, we're snaking Vampiro, and he's coming over here for nothing. And in fact, I, ICP has nothing to do with it. We just happen to know people in the music industry, and we made some connections for Vampiro. He's doing things on his own, and he's doing it, and he's doing a monstrous job at it. I think both of you guys, everybody would be shocked if you heard Vampiro's album, because it, it really yeah. is good. It's very good. Are you are you involved in doing anything? I think I read somewhere with the Nitro Girls or or something like that, trying to make a band out of them. No, I, I well Spice. Melissa of the Nitro Girls, she's not one of the Nitro Girls anymore, but she asked me to uh, help her in the music industry, and she, um, uh, I guess her and uh, four of the other Nitro Girls were, were going to do an all-girl band, you know, like a, a female Backstreet Boys, mm -hmm. but I told her that uh, the kind of music we do is just not, you know, I would love to be involved in something like that, you know, because of the money that those kind of groups make, you know, I would love to do something like that, but... I don't know the first thing about that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. the kind of stuff we do, we sell records through touring and through underground methods, you know, and, and that's like a complete pop thing, and, and I wouldn't know what to do. So I talked to her about it, and I and I hooked her up with an attorney in L.A., and uh, I haven't talked to her since then. Okay. But I would love to be involved in that. In okay. more ways than just music, if you know what I mean. <laughs> I would love to be involved in the... In, 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 uh, she is a friend of mine. She came down to a couple JCW shows. It was awesome. And she was our ring girl. You know, the ring girl, the girl that holds up, you know, match one, match two. Right, 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 right. And then as the show goes on, they take more and more clothes off? That's right. She yeah. was nearly butthole naked by the end of the show, which was pretty awesome. But I won't yeah. get into that because she is a married woman. So details <laughs> on that will have to remain anonymous. <laughs> They're already kind of out there already right now. <laughs> I get asked so much about her, you know what I mean? <laughs> what more can you say? Well, actually, there's probably more that you could say. Uh, let's see. Um, can we get uh, Ian back on? Yes, definitely. I just wanted to clear it up. Thank you, guys. Okay, you're very welcome. Here's this is Jay of ICP. We've got uh, Dave Carroll back. Yeah. Hey, how are you? <laughs> how are you? <laughs> I'm, doing, I'm doing pretty good. When you so, go no, back, I got that cleared up. No, that, yeah. When we, when we go back... Uh, from your beginnings in WCW... Can I clear something else up before you do this? This is really ahead, quick. Sure. This okay. is what pissed me off. You know, I used to have a website, www.vampiro.net, mm -hmm. and I, I, you know what? That was a really popular website, and right now there's a lot of shit that WCW is doing. Uh, and you know what? I'm not going to speak bad about Bob Ryder, because I, I, I haven't confronted him about it yet, but the girl who used to run the website is going off everywhere, in the press saying that I owed her money for this site and all that kind of stuff I never knew about this fucking site I got nothing to do with this site I mean I tried to but I hate the internet I hate computers because I'm computer illiterate, illiterate I'm an idiot I don't know how to do that kind of shit and they did this website for me and it was awesome it was an awesome website and I met a lot of cool people and I got a lot of support through it but when I got hurt and then I had my baby and all this these things I, I was going to get involved with it financially but when I got hurt you know, the, even these people on the website, they freaked out because I didn't send them a check for it, and, and I didn't call them, and I wasn't posting. You know, God forbid that I, that I can't walk anymore, but, you know, they're worried about the website. I would just like to say to those people to go fuck themselves and leave me alone. And, you know, I'm really thankful for what you did, and I love the people on there, and I love the people who supported me, but leave me the fuck alone in the press. Stop saying that I, that I did bad things to you because I don't even know you people. So go away. Okay. okay. Go ahead. Now, now going back to uh, to your career in, in when you were in when you were in WCW, what would you say was the the high point? Where do you think they? I mean, there are probably several several times, but where do you think that it went that it went south for you? And um, I think it went south before I even got in there. Mm -hmm. I was politically blocked from day one. You know that. You know Conan and I had a huge problem in Mexico. When I came in there, Conan was really tight with Kevin Nash. And all those guys, Scott Hall, and those guys, and they and they blocked me, and they admit it to me now. The strange, the best, the good thing about this is Conan and I are friends. We talk on the phone like at least twice a week. I mean, we're super cool with each other. You know, we laugh about how how stupid things were before. But when I first got to WCW, I was, I was it, it was bad for me. I mean, I I'm super loyal to Terry Taylor, and and we bang heads once in a while, and and you know, 
I said a bad joke on on the internet a little while ago, well, last week actually, and it got back to him, and he got really upset about it. But you know, life goes on. I didn't mean anything by it. But as soon as I got in there, he he left. He went to WWF. I got put on the shelf for a year and a half. I mean, I I, I just I, I was doomed from day one in that company. You think it was a vampiro name? Like they saw you as Luchador? Well, for the first year and a half, they thought I was Mexican, and. Um, you know, that's how I, 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 I read it. In that country, in that company, I think there's there's huge amounts of racism. I mean, look at look at the Japanese kids that were there. You know, uh, when Sonny Ono was there with his gang, a guy as an Ultimate Dragon. Those are some phenomenal kids. Where are they now? All the Mexicans. There was 18 guys from Mexico City there. There were big name wrestlers and all through Latin America. They came up here to the United States. They went to WCW. They got treated like job boys, and then they got and then they all got fired. I mean, I think a lot of it had to do with with. Uh, the fact that they did think I was Mexican, and a lot of it had to do with, with you know, just the politics of, of pro wrestling. You know, I don't, I don't think Sting was exactly jumping up and down. That there was a, another guy that was in the same mold as him, and a lot of the big, big name guys, you know, guys like Diamond Dallas Page and that, they wanted nothing to do with me either. So it was really hard for me. And nobody yeah. really stopped to ask you if you were American or Canadian. <laughs> uh, no, not really. I didn't talk to anybody. I didn't go there for a year and a half. Like I would call that office three times a day, got the phone bill to prove it, begging to come to work, and and it just did not happen. And then Kevin Sullivan hated me, hated me like a motherfucker. I don't know why. And you know, at this point in time, I don't care anymore. But you know, that didn't really help me either. I I, I had an uphill battle from day one. You know. But I did my best. I tried. You know, I certainly thought I had a lot to give. But it just every time it seemed like I was getting momentum. And Dave, you know me very well. You know I suck as a wrestler, but I'm improving. I try my hardest. But every time I was getting momentum, I got shut down. You know, there's nothing I could do about it. And it was a real pain in the ass after a while. Then when Vince Russo came in, Vince Russo didn't even know my first name. He had no idea. He, he couldn't even say Vampiro. He had to say Vampiro. He didn't. <laughs> even acknowledge my existence and I would phone that fuck at home every day supporting him giving him ideas trying to be a team player trying to be a leader and, and he you know Vince Russo and I banged heads the first time when uh, we were doing the demon angle and he wanted me to, to hit a girl and, and, and you know you violence against women I, and I refused to do it and Eric Bischoff went to bat for me that day and it got really ugly behind the, the scenes, you know. And then from that day on, things just went super downhill for me. Then I came with, up with the idea, with you know, with with the insane clown posse. I said, "Listen, man, I'm telling you, I did it in Mexico. Believe me, it's not a gimmick. This whole vampiro thing ain't a gimmick. Like I'm really involved in underground music. JCW would be a, it would be a, a great idea to bring a legit underground wrestling promotion in there and tell you to go fuck yourself and challenge you on TV." We did it one day. It got super over. Never seen it again. So I, mean, I don't know what to tell you. I was going to ask you that uh, you were you. Were, I think that the one point where you're really starting to gain some momentum in WCW, you were doing the program with Jeff Jarrett. You and Sting were doing a tag team, and then Bischoff and Russo came back and did the Millionaires Club New Blood thing, which basically forced you by not being a millionaire to turn heel when you were starting to get over as a babyface, and I. I don't know you, if you ever really got got going after that. No, um, I, I, I said it from day one. I don't know how to be a heel. It's bad enough that I'm not really that great of a wrestler. But I had, you know, the whole thing about being Vampiro was the charisma, the interaction with the people was uh, was just selling and making the big comeback. I don't know what it was, but I had like you know that angel on my shoulder that that I just connected with the people, you know, because I guess. It, I was very accessible in and out of the ring, so that was the the thing, you know. And, and I hated being a heel. I hated everything I did after that day. I begged not to be involved, but I had no, you know, there's nothing I can do. The thing with Jeff Jarrett, I mean, I was. They called me on a Friday uh, before the TV taping in Minneapolis, St. Paul. They said, "Listen, Monday night you're going to get the U.S. title." And I was, you know, I thought it was phenomenal. They called me Sunday night and said, ah, "Plans changed," and after that. Um, it was all over for me, so I don't know what to tell you. What were your reactions when they first told you about the graveyard match with the demon? Um, it was hard because, you know, I, I get along real well with Dale Torborg, you know, 
and and I got nothing bad to say about him. The only the only thing that it was really hard to do because we kept having to redo things at the last second because I wouldn't do violence against women, you know, and then like there were things where I would have to violate the girl and you know physically hit her and shit like that. And I just I wouldn't do it. So you know, at the last second, there was all these changes. I don't think they got the results they wanted out of it, and I don't think it has anything to do with me or Dale uh, as workers. I just think it has to do with me not uh, wanting to hit a woman, and I, I guess I, I stood my ground the best I could, and uh, I think that that was it was really hard for me to do that because it was a great idea, but there was just no way I was going to do violence against women. What's your thoughts as far as an, when you were in WCW, you did the angle with Sting where they had the stunt man set on fire and thrown thrown off the ledge, and you know it was one of those weird things where. You know, injury angles, you know, you've, you've done them yourself in Mexico and everything. You know, I mean, you know when it's done right, it can draw money and everything. It's somehow WCW could do the most elaborate injury angle, and by the way they don't follow up, no one ever takes it seriously, and it's almost like, why did you even bother doing it? And that was one of the examples. It's like they did something so preposterous that, you know, when Sting came back, it was like, you know, no one took any of it seriously. No, everyone knew he didn't fall off that ledge, and the thing was gimmicked, and he wasn't on fire anyway. Okay, you said. <laughs> I try to imagine myself being you. Why did you even do that? I didn't answer like that. I was like, "What the fuck is wrong with you guys?" That's what I said. And uh, you know, I I can't. It's never. It's not my style to attack somebody. It's really easy for me to say, "Hey, you know, Sting's an asshole." But uh, you know, I I don't get him. I don't get him at all. I mean, exactly. Why the fuck would you do something like that? That's never been done. And, you know, I didn't like the match. I thought the match sucked. You know, I, I, I thought it could have been a lot better match. I was really surprised that Sting took it home as quick as he did. Uh, and then he came back, like, as if nothing happened. You know, he, wasn't, he didn't even acknowledge the match. And I, I just thought that that really sucked on his part. And I think it, it sucked even more on WCW's part. I mean, why did you do that? And the whole world was like, what the fuck happened? And I said, hey, you know what? It ain't me. I felt so stupid because I had to try to explain to wrestling fans, you know, what what the hell was going on and how fake was that and, and my God, and embarrassing and this and that. And we followed the storyline and all of a sudden it's just like forgotten. So, I mean, call, call the brainchild behind that one, Vince Russo at home. What now... In your match with Vampiro, I mean, with, uh, with I mean, with Mike Awesome, that match kind of fell apart with a deal with the fan, and then what, what, what's your thoughts as far as like when you look back at that match at Halloween Havoc? I I do the same match today. I got nothing bad to say about Mike Awesome. You know, I called that finish, and I I, I think I'm a professional, and I'm not scared to take any bump, even though I know it's a, a you know I could have killed myself, and and I know that I'm hurt, and I know that I'm I, I'm a walking injury. And I knew that that was pushing the envelope, but, you know, we were supposed to have tables under the ring, and you could see in the match that, that I was walking around looking for tables. That was supposed to cushion the blow, and there wasn't any. And I was like, fuck. And I knew I was going to get killed, but, you know, I took the bump anyways. And I got, like I said, I'll say it again, I got nothing to say bad about Mike Awesome. I mean, that's part of the game. That's part of being a, a professional wrestler. That's what sets you apart from the other guys, the million-dollar babies that just sit in the dressing room and cry if they stub their toe. You know, I ain't like that. I can't sell out and take WCW's money and not work hard. So, you know, I'll take, I, if I had to do it over, today I'd do the same match and I'd take the same bump at the same risk. No questions asked. Were most of your other 15 concussions Mexico? Yeah, uh, some in Japan. Yeah, for doing crazy things just like that, you know, jumping on the balconies and, uh, you know, chair shots and all that kind of stuff. Uh, just, just, I always try to take it a, a, another notch, you know, try to step it up a little bit. And give the fans, you know, if the fans pay a lot of money to see a good show, and and I tried to go that extra mile, you know, and in WCW, my God, you just that ain't pro wrestling, that ain't pro wrestling, man. Those those guys, I can't speak bad about anybody in the company, you know, because I got a lot of friends in there, but but the company itself, that ain't pro wrestling. Where, where is there a period or or or, or a place where you think that they lost sight of what the business was? Yeah, and I think it started way before I got there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, American wrestling in general kind of is kind of weird, isn't it? If you compare it to Japan or Mexico or anybody else in the world. 
Well, it's it's it's, it's different, but the WWF, I mean, more. I mean, even with the mistakes that they'll sometimes make, you know, you can kind of see the goals of where they're. You know, they have goals of what they're trying to hit, and they usually get there, and if they make a mistake, they usually get away from it. I, I don't, were, I, I, WCW, it, you know, I don't know why we have to go there for 16 hours or 9 hours before a show and, and to plan and plan and plan and walk through things that, that last a minute and a half on TV and they still fuck it up. I, I think that's a big mistake on their part. They take these, these young kids out of the power plant and, and they throw them on TV, but they don't, instead of letting them go out and do these independent territories or send them to a small company in Japan or to Mexico for 6 months to get experience. And, I mean, it's real easy to get all jacked up on steroids and to say you're a pro wrestler, you know. But that's how guys get hurt. So I, I think that's where they started to get away from pro wrestling. They just forgot it. You know, you actually have to learn how to work instead of just being a pretty body. Let's go to the phone lines. Let's start with Phil in D.C. Phil, what's going on? Hey, Dave. Uh, Brian uh, Vampiro. How's it going? It's going well. How are you uh, doing? Pretty good. Um, I actually wanted to ask you guys, uh, Vamp, a question about his time in Mexico. Um who did he like working with over there? Everybody. Who did he like working with, and who did he, um, like? What do you think some of his better matches were? Um, I, I think that I was the worst wrestler in the world at that point in time. I did nothing but you know roll around and take bumps and just make a little comeback at the end. So I mean, I wasn't exactly a great wrestler until my end of my run in Mexico. But uh, I worked, I liked working with everybody. It was a blast. It was fun. So you know, there's not one person in particular and there's not one match in particular every day was a new adventure down there so I, I don't know if that answers your question at all but you know, anything else though uh, no that's pretty much it I'm it, I was uh, I actually saw him wrestle in Mexico probably one of his last Mexican matches down in Monterey it was pretty fun it's a mm -hmm. blast isn't it it's different yeah you, you have fun yeah I think me and you were the only white guys in the whole building that sounds all right <laughs> you know the thing with, with Mexico is is the crowd well, the crowd is really intense, especially in the early, I guess we were, early 90s was the real glory period. Um, you know, it just hit big on Mexico City television, I guess. What do you attribute that, you know, looking back eight, nine years, when that real big thing right when you first started, was it, was it the beginning of television and just, you know, new fans combined with the old fans, or what do you think it was? Cause yeah, was I think that's what it was, new fans combined with the old fans, and uh, the explosion on television. And at that period in time, there was, there was a couple other guys, you know, but that was the first real mix of popular culture, you know, music, fashion, uh, soap operas, actors, actresses, and pro wrestling was all thrown in the same boat, you know, like it was like MTV just got to Mexico, so wrestling got a big shot in the arm, it had a new look, it had something fresh, uh, and I think that, you know, it was in style at the time, so it was something definitely new, you know, there was a lot of hardcore old school fans but then there was a lot of young people that started coming out, too, and there was a lot of people that were public figures coming out to wrestling. Wrestling was the big thing to do on a Friday night. Was, was, how much of that do you think was Pena, or was, do you think Pena was just in the right place at the right time, too? Um, I think that, jeez, I think Pena was in the right place at the right time. Okay. Let's go to John in Chicago. John. Hey, you guys. Hey. Uh, first of all, uh, Vampiro. Yep. Uh, you were a pretty good wrestler. From just from looking, uh, I, I shouldn't even say were. You are a pretty good wrestler. Ah, uh, thanks. Um, a better bullshit artist. Yeah. Don't. I mean, don't sell yourself short for all the bullshit that was happening over in WCW. But um, as far as um, I was wondering, as far as your decision to like, I guess break uh, to break off your ties with WCW. Did any of the, uh, the 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 decision like with uh, how they treated Bret Hart as far as his concussion in the ring there, or even earlier even earlier um, instances with other wrestlers as far as injuries with uh, how WCW treated earlier injuries? Did that affect me? Hell yeah! Listen, I'll tell you something straight about pro wrestling. If you get hurt and you're done, if I I, I got a family, I got a baby who's seven weeks old. If I broke my leg today. WCW would pay me for a full month. Then they would cut my pay to a third. Then after 45 days, they would cut me completely and fire me. What would I do? What could I do to feed my family? Nothing. If I got a concussion right now, if I took one more fall on my head in the next two weeks, I could have been a vegetable. I came within a half an inch of breaking my neck. The doctor studied the tape with me. They're surprised I'm still alive. What would WCW do to my family? Would they take care of my family? Would they pay for my baby's schooling? Hell no. So I had to make a decision. Everybody's, you know, so concerned. Like, 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 yeah, the way they treated other wrestlers, like Ultimate Dragon, his mm -hmm. army, his, 
he had an injury. WCW got him operated on. The doctor made a mistake, cut a nerve in his arm. His left arm is completely dead. He can't even tie his own shoes. He can never wrestle again. Are they taking care of his family? Hell no. Do you so, think? Do you think eventually there? I mean, the pressure is going to be built up that there's going to have to be a union. There okay. has to be. Somebody's got to have the balls to to do it. You know, everybody is surprised that I, everybody is saying, "Oh, Vampiro just up and quit to be a musician." It's not the case, dog. I mean, I got a family. I got a, you know, WCW was going to fire me if I didn't quit. So I had to get a new job, and this is what I do now. But um, somebody, do you somebody's got to have the will balls be a to start union? a union. Do you think? Do you think? Were, you know, because I, I actually just this morning was talking. I mean, I, for years I've talked with wrestlers, and the union thing always comes up. And it's one of those things where I've almost gotten to the point where I think it'll never happen. It'll never but, happen. Okay, you think that too? Because I, cause I, I will say that I've talked to people, and as far as WCW goes, I think that there's more, there may be more of a, of a chance, maybe just because of the dissatisfaction with management now than ever before. But I don't know. Do you think it could ever, do you think it really could ever happen? No. Okay. Well, well, in the absence of a union, are you going to pursue legal um, uh, consequences against uh, um, WCW? I'm trying to, but at the same time, I really can't because at the time that I signed that contract, I was in such a position financially and professionally that I had to sign the contract that they gave me. I also would have been out of a job. Mm -hmm. And and they fuck you. They, 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 they give you these contracts that, listen, dog, it's like selling your soul to the devil. You sign that paper and you're done. They got everything in their favor and you got nothing in your favor. And that's the way it is everywhere. That's the chance you take being a pro wrestler. And I knew that going in, and that's fine. And you know what? Ten years ago, I would have did the same thing. That's just the way it is. You know, and maybe I'm to blame for that. But, uh, pro well, you know, they got you signed to these contracts, and you're an independent contractor, yet you can't do anything. I mean, they own your, they own your life. They, you sign away the rights to your name, your look, everything you do. So, I mean, you're, you basically sign your, you, know, you sell your soul to the devil. Well, good good luck um, with all your future endeavors and you know, God, I'm gonna rock. Tonight is the first show mm -hmm. of the Bizarre Bizarre tour. It's sold out already. And not only that, my album's in the works. I'm gonna be on MTV on well, Thursday. You know, after two weeks being in the music business, that's pretty big. That's that's a lot more I can say from WCW's done for anybody as their clamp. I'm gonna be on Howard Stern, and I hope that somebody from WWF is listening because I am definitely trying to get into that company. I know I can. And as soon as my injury clears up, I mean, if they if they accept me, I'll be there. Well, that well, uh, I hope you again. Good luck, and our prayers are with you. Thanks, dog. Thanks. Okay. How would that work with your PW contract? Are you gonna have to wait until it would have run out before you go to the WWF? Probably, but I quit. I'm trying to quit, and they won't call me back to say that I've called their legal department for the last three weeks, saying I can't physically do it anymore. I mean, I can turn into a vegetable. I got a concussion. My brain is so swollen they can't do any more tests on me. I got a permanent speech impediment for the rest of my life. I mean, I don't see what they don't get. And the doctor said if they release, went, once I'm cleared to wrestle, it's at my own risk. You know, I, if I take another chair shot, there's no, I mean, nothing will happen or something will dev devastating could happen. It's all up to me, you know? So even if WCW does their bullshit and they have me under that lock and stock and barrel deal for six months so that I can't go anywhere, I, I'm on tour, you know what I mean? It's not like I, I'm dying to do it, you know? Uh, we got a full bank of phone calls here for Vampiro. Dave, uh, run yes. I never solicited drugs from a minor it's or his mom. <laughs> it's all it's, it's a joke. The fuck, I, the stuff that's on the hotline. It's a joke, you dumb motherfuckers. Oh God yeah, I damn know. it! Not you, Dave. The other, the people out there. Oh, I know. I I I, I read I read all that stuff. I buy my yeah. own drugs. I got my own prescriptions. Yeah. I'm just kidding. It's a joke. <laughs> Hey, is this your first uh, concert tonight since your concussion? Yeah. Are you afraid that's going to mess with your head? Fuck yeah. I got mega earplugs and, and, and I got a special monitor in front of me because I forget half the stuff. But that's rock and roll, daddy. Now, what city, what city are you in tonight? Cleveland. Okay, and where, where what are some of the cities you're going to be in in the next couple of days? We're in Boston tomorrow and then we're in New York on Saturday night. And are you doing uh, are you doing any uh, like stuff like Stern this week or anything? Or is that like for uh, I think we're doing Stern Friday. I think because we're doing MTV, MTV deal Thursday. Thursday. Okay, wh and what time on MTV? I got no clue. It's gonna be uh, it's gonna be an MTV news thing, and it'll be uh, rotated throughout the day. But they're definitely gonna be addressing me as a wrestler leaving wrestling to play rock and roll. So it's gonna be a kind of good thing. Oh, okay. And I can tell them they can check it all out at www.wrestlingobserver.com. Yeah. 
Is that okay? <laughs> go for yeah, it. Yeah, it's okay. All right. Okay. Let's go to Roick in Las Vegas. Roick, what's going on? Yeah, hey, guys. It's Rourke, actually, but... Rourke. How are you, Vampiro? I'm fine. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Um, I got a story about Havoc. Um, I went 30 minutes to the show before the show to MGM, spent 30 bucks, sat third row. So that tells you about the interest in that pay-per-view. Um, during your match, you know, the Thrillers, they took all the tables in their prior match. The Natural Born Ratings Killers? I, I don't know who they were, but they stole all your tables... And WCW, they didn't supply enough materials for you to be, you and uh, Austin to be successful. Nice. And uh, I saw you, and Austin didn't know what to do. He didn't know if you wanted to take that move or not. Still, once you were unsuccessful finding tables, and you kind of like motioned to him, you know, let's let's do it, let's do it, let's do it. Uh, when you took that move, you laid motion motionless for about two minutes. Yeah. And no one came out to get you. Nope. Nice, and, huh? No one, I don't know if uh, the 15 people on pay-per-view saw this, but no one came to get you. No, they, they didn't. They, they didn't know that. I, oh, God, I, God I forbid said, that somebody breaks up their card game in the back and they got to do something to help one of their talent. Yeah, I, w I was talking to my buddies. I'm like, this guy, I mean, he's really hurt. Um, I, I was so surprised no one came to get you. You got up on your own and you motioned to the crowd, and that was like one of the biggest pops of the night when you finally got up. And did your little uh, vampiro with your arms in the air? Uh, did you see the push? The security pushed me out of the way so I wouldn't block Lance Storm's entrance. I, they they tried to they tried to throw you out. It was ridiculous. Yeah, nice, huh? I, I couldn't <laughs> believe it. I couldn't because you, that was you, right you, after Bret Hart. Did Did you guys? Boy, so I was like, can I ask about that? Did you guys? For, um, Ian, did you see the pay per view on Sunday? WCW. No, I didn't even know they had one. Okay, they had a pay per view Sunday. In fact, we were talking about this. They did a thing with Bam Bam Bigelow. It was actually a duplicate to an extent of what happened with you. Actually, I thought they were spoofing Orndorff, which isn't a great thing to spoof either. No. Other people thought they were spoofing Owen Hart, but what it was, in, in the middle of a match after it was Bigelow and Sergeant Awal, Bigelow won, and then Bigelow collapsed, and it was a work thing. You know, this was a total work thing. They carried him out, and, you know, it ended up leading to an angle later, you know, in the very next match. But, um, it's, it's, I thought that it was pretty weird, and I wasn't really, and I mean, I wasn't thinking of the fact that, like, you know, you took a bump, and, um, you know, on the previous pay-per-view, because I was thinking more of Orndorff, because Orndorff, Orndorff actually looked scarier because he was motionless for so long, and the idea that, you know, like, they'll do that on, so literally on two straight pay-per-views, you had guy shaken up real, real bad, and then they worked it on the next one, which is, is like wrestling. I mean, that is what they would do, but it's kind of like, it's kind of weird in a way, you know what I mean, that it's the only thing people... Even this fake angle, I mean, Bigelow collapses and the referee's signaling the back and nobody comes to help. I know, you know, God forbid that, that uh, the medical staff of WCW has to break up their card game in the back or put down the PlayStation to actually play, to pay attention to what's going on up there. What? No, you know, even the Bret Hart thing, you know, you had your concussions, you know, literally right after Bret Hart announced his retirement and was fired over the concussions. Yeah, nice. And enough. what, you know, what was, what was your thought because... You know, you know, as as you know, and it's been a big subject of controversy. There was so much skepticism in the company because Bret Hart had just gone down, and I'm sure there was plenty of skepticism of Bret Hart too, even though his concussions were legitimate, and and you had a legitimate concussion, and there were still people who were just saw the bump, saw everything, and it was just like, oh, you know, like you know, you know what I mean, like the total disbelief. I mean, what yeah, was well, what was your thoughts when when I mean, the biggest thing was to prove to prove that you know you really weren't hurt and you were gold it or whatever. Well, uh, when I had, you know, when I, I, I broke my ribs in Toronto at the pay-per-view with AWOL, and I, and I showed up to work the next day. I broke my eye socket with Billy Kidman in a pay-per-view, and I think it was in San Francisco. Actually, I think it was with ICP when he did that shooting star press, and I was in my face, cracked my eye socket. I showed up the next day, didn't complain. Uh, so when, when I took that bump, everybody's like, well, fuck, he's a tough kid. He never complains, so he must be doing something, trying to get out of work or something like that. And uh, you got the medical report, Dave. You got the actual medical report. I know you do. And when I was sitting at home, no feeling in my hands, and I was not allowed to hold my brand new baby because they were scared I was going to drop her. And WCW called me, accusing me of, of, of faking the injury. Uh, I think that's the first time that somebody made me cry. Oh, you know, I just felt crushed, brokenhearted. Um, is uh, Rourke, are you still there? Yeah, yeah. I just want to say, I mean. Can a uh, ring technician tell anyone in the back that your your arms were literally shaking, and you know you, you couldn't get to the back? I mean, you're the guy who always wanted to wrestle, 
I mean, you job to Chris Adams, like, saying that you would do that. You, you got worked by Rick Steiner in 30 seconds. I mean, can't they see that you're a team guy? No. But WWF will. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> All right, Van. Thanks. Okay, let's Bye. go to Dave in Arizona. Dave, what's going on? Uh, not much. Um, Vamp, I've, I've met a couple times, and I've noticed that one of the things... And I am a dick, was... aren't I? I told you. I've said that from day one, dog. Go, go ahead, Dave. <laughs> yeah, I, I met you a couple times back, <laughs> Vamp. I, I met you like a week before the uh, the pay-per-view where you wrestled Mike Awesome. Uh-huh. And, and, and I, was just, I was just wondering that with, with all this that uh, went down, uh, one of the guys who claims to say he was a friend of yours was Bob Ryder. Yep. And then Bob Ryder, w- one of the things that kind of disgusted me is how he put over WCW for ignoring your concussion, and, then, uh, and he defended WCW for, uh, for booking you in a match to take the exact same bump with Mike Austin that you took the night before. So, I mean, so what kind of friend is this person is basically what I was wondering. I mean, there has to be some resentment for Bob Ryder's uh, defending WCW. Um, his job. Hey, man, he's, he's got rent to pay, too, right? Yeah. He needs a paycheck. Yeah, okay, I mean, and you know what? At this stage in the game, it means nothing to me. I mean, you know, in, in 45 minutes, I'm about to go out and rock the house. i got a full house here waiting to see us. You know, I, I don't really... WCWs. The other thing I was wondering about, and this is my last question, I was just wondering, is there any uh, resentment uh, for Sting not putting you over? No, hell no. I don't give a fuck winning or losing, dog. It's all about the game. It's all about giving you your money's worth. I could lose every single night of my life, and it doesn't matter, as long as you get a good match. The thing that bothers me about Sting, he wins, but he's a lazy fuck, too. So, you know, what can you do? But I guess, you know, living in Beverly Hills and working on your flowers all day, that does that to you. What the hell? Did I just say that? <laughs> you said it. <laughs> I said it and I meant it, so fuck it. Yeah, you know, the the thing, there's a lot of guys in the company. I mean, what, what what's your feeling as far as the company, as far as, I, I, I don't want to use, I guess, the term haves and haves nots, but there's a certain, there was a certain group of about, you know, ten or so guys um, that were, you know, they were totally protected, they and they still are, and they make, they make huge money and they are perceived as stars and and people think of them as stars but somehow you know there's because of the lack of upward mobility in the company they you know cl- clearly I think in, in almost every case they've um, I, I guess gotten lazy or just um, they certainly don't have the hunger I mean none of the top guys really have that hunger and the guy the younger guys who do have the hunger you know they're kind of beaten down politically because there's just no up there's limited I should say no but limited upward mobility even with you no matter how good or bad you had done, I think that, like, we all realized that you kind of bounced your head against the top of that ceiling, you know, as far as you were going to go, and then you were just, okay, that was your spot. You were never going to, you were never, they were never going to have, put, you know, you put you over Sting, you know, as far as, it doesn't matter, I'm not talking about winning or losing, I'm just saying put you over on that level, right. or put you with Nash and those guys, and if you had a good match or a bad match, you know, to, to, to the company, I think one of, the most, one of the frustrating things for a lot of the guys there is, is that, there's no if you had a good match. I mean, you you got to read about it on the internet. The company itself, they don't really they don't really notice the good from the bad. No, they don't. And I can tell you something right now. When when that match when the when the main event is almost over, those guys are already in their cars. The agents and, and the and the people doing the TV show are already are already out of the building. They don't even see the end of the show. Oh, uh, Vamp, there's one other thing I just thought about to ask you. Did, when you beat Hulk Hogan, did that uh, on a Nitro? I think it was uh, earlier this year. Did that in fact mean anything to you? And do you feel that it elevated you at all? I don't even remember. It didn't help. It, 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 it was the nature. I mean, we joked about the next day. I mean, you remember this day. They, um, you know, he got a one, two, three over Hogan. Hogan got up, beat up Vamp, beat up Vamp the whole match. I mean, it was. I think it was Hogan. It was Hogan trying to get himself over to somebody that hey, I'll do a star, I'll do a job even for this mid card guy. But at the same time, it was just like with Kidman. I mean, he laid down for Kidman a couple of times, but you know, I mean, it didn't do I'm Kidman cool any Hulk. good. You know, I don't, I don't got any problems with Hulk. He's really nice to me behind the scenes, and I really like him. You know, just being in the ring with him was kind of like, damn, you know, because I was young. That's Hulk Hogan, dog, you know what I mean? But uh, I don't even remember that match. I don't even remember when we talked about it at the start of this interview. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I remember, Dave, I remember you saying on the show, like, after that match, you said that that was a better-than-average match. But I guess since you were in the ring with Hulk Hogan, that must be saying something. I guess I, that, that would be, because he didn't have a lot of better-than-average matches in the last couple of years. Hulk Hogan was <laughs> in the ring with me, man. <laughs> 
<laughs> Dave, okay, Dave, Dave yeah. I got I got to start to wind this down, brother. We're gonna play in half an hour. Okay, cool. All right. Do you want okay, me to that take was... one more phone call? Do you want to ask me something else? Do you want me to tell somebody to go fuck themselves? What do you want me to do? We'll go. We'll go with one more call. We'll get Andrew in New Jersey. And Andrew, what's going on? Hello, Dave. How you doing? It's going good. Um, Vampiro, I got a couple questions for you. Go nuts. Um, if say you're to go to the WWF right now, uh huh, who would you like to wrestle the most? Um, Chris Benoit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, would you like to be in any of the stables or anything? Or would you like to be a lone wolf? I'd like to be a lone penis, a oh, wolf. Good because I don't like that whole like thing with you and the demon and no. WCW that whole crap. No, I, you know what? I just want to be part of the team. I don't care. I just want to work hard. I don't want to go oh. out like this. You know what I mean? I, I worked 16 years of my life to, to learn how to wrestle. Mm-hmm. I think I have something to give, and I, and I just want to give it. All right. What's 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 your thoughts on um, the situation with Muda? I know that like when he came in, you know, you kind of, um, you know, you were, you know, he was sort of an idol of yours. I'm when embarrassed you started wrestling. with Muda. They they Vince Russo, plain and simple, said to me, "Fuck Muda. He ain't shit here." So that's a quote. So I mean, I. I I felt embarrassed. I felt sad because that's the great Muda. He's an innovator. He's a, he's a heavyweight icon in pro wrestling, and they embarrassed him, and they and they treated him like garbage, and 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 I was I was just humiliated for him. What as far as like his physical condition though, he um he could still he came, go. The great Muda with no legs is fifty times better than the WCW put together. Anything else, Andrew? I think he's gone. Andrew's gone. Okay. Um, I guess we probably should wrap up this segment and then uh, head to a break. I want to... Oh, whoa. What was that? I don't know. I'm okay. an alien. Well, anyway, um, I, Vamp, I want to thank you very much for doing the show. I'm sorry. Was it what you wanted? Did you get what you needed? Uh, it's fine. It's fine. I want and I, hope, I, want, I want to wish you the best of luck tonight. I hope, uh, I hope your head doesn't ring too much when the, when the night's over. I'll call you when it's done. Okay, great. Thanks. i got to call some controversy before I go, though. Okay, well, you want to you leave on with some controversy? Go ahead. Fuck yeah, I think that Brad Siegel should take a pay cut and pay the guys that are underpaid, the guys who deserve it, the mid-card guys, the guys who, who busted their ass. He's so worried about the company going down going down under, going down in flames, and WCW this, WCW that. Well, those fucking million-dollar babies who got those no-cut contracts who don't want to work, Mr. Siegel, if you got so much faith in WCW, and instead of ruling with an iron fist from your big plush office in the CNN Tower, you take a pay cut, motherfucker, and you pay the guys who are breaking their balls and putting their lives on the risk and risking their family lives and, and going away from home and leaving their babies and stuff like that just for you. You give them the money. Let's see how much you believe in WCW now, motherfucker. And with that, okay. I gotta right. go play rock and roll. Well, uh, let's get to Mike. Mike, what's going on? Hey, what's up, Dave? Not too much. Listen, if, if Van Piero thinks uh, that the wrestling industry was, you know, bad to him, that there's a lot of characters, wait till he gets the, uh, wait till he uh, figures out what's going to happen to him in the music industry. Because they're saying Clown Posse is going to take him over the hurdle. He thinks no. Russo is bad and WCW is bad. Insane Clown Posse probably would get him signed to a bad deal, you know. And if, if he's making double the pay, you know, working for Insane Clown Posse, then wrestling, I don't believe that. You're playing bass, playing bass guitar, I doubt it. Basses are a dime a dozen. When you can't I, play, when you can't play guitar, you pick up the bass. I think even if he's making half, making half and not suffering an 18th concussion if he's actually at 17 is better than you know risking your health for double the money. He'll be back in wrestling in no time. I mean, oh yeah, he, he pretty much said he'll be back in wrestling. The way he was carrying on, you would think he was the greatest wrestler of all time. Uh, I don't think he. Uh, I don't think he quite said that. He was yeah, but you know, he was this and the fans and the fans really loved him. I, I never, I never, I never got that watching uh, WCW, watching him, thinking the fans really loved him. No, uh, every time he, he he did all he did all right, and then when they turned him, you know, it was the same thing as as every mid card guy. And one more thing I want to say about uh, uh, the Radicals, or whatever they're called, the Rascals, or whatever they're called in WWF. How come every time they're in a match with each other, you always say disappointing, not as good as you would think? When are these guys going to live up to their potential? And enough with the excuses. Uh, I, I, rarely, I rarely say that Benoit's matches are disappointing. Um, but Saturn, I know that every time they're matched together, any, even Jericho is matched with any of them. Disappointing, not as good as you would think. Really? I mean, at what point are they going to turn it on? Um, uh, I think Benoit. I think Benoit's been uh, pretty much phenomenal. I think Benoit's been probably the best guy in the whole business, actually. As far but as, outside um, of Benoit. Okay, Saturn. I, I haven't seen a lot of Saturn. Hasn't been that great. Uh, Malenko. Malenko's been pretty good. 
I mean, Malenko, Malenko we, we knew Malenko was going to have a problem in the WWF. I mean, it was one of those things, his style is more Japanese-oriented, but he works hard, smaller. he works solid, he's, and he's small. Eddie yeah. Guerrero, Eddie Guerrero is a personality, he's done better than I thought in the ring. Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't know that Eddie Guerrero is as good as he was five years ago, um, but also, you know, hey, he's working with Billy Gunn. Yeah, you he know, has, Eddie right hasn't really had a chance to prove what he can do. And a lot of these guys, you talk about all these Mexican guys that do with big stars over in Mexico and stuff in Japan. You know, Mr. Big, the, you know, the, the, the poser band, you know, they're humongous in Japan. They don't sell nothing here. I mean, it's a whole different ball game over there, you know? And, and, and What's... And music <laughs> bands, like bands like uh, uh, over in England and stuff, are humongous over in England, they come over here, they're nothing. They're, they're lucky to sell 10,000 copies. Over Damn here, Beatles. I mean, you can't say it's racism in WCW. That's why they're not being pushed. I mean, I, I, I'm, a, uh, I'm a regular wrestling fan. I don't like I, the I, 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 Yeah, yeah but they're not even giving them a chance. Yeah, that's right. There's no. There's, but you know, what I'm, kind I, of chance? You got to go out there and do your thing. If you got a five minute match, you got to go, go out, out there, there and do your thing. Okay, okay. Well, just as an example, just like just of those guys on uh, on the pay per view, um, the Young Dragons and those guys. The best guy on that whole show was Kaz Hayashi. His match started to get over. Do you think that it made any difference? Do you think when Eddie Guerrero was out there having phenomenal matches or Mysterio Jr. when they first got there, were they given a chance to uh, go up? No, they weren't. They, they, they were, you know, yeah, but nobody... the fans, they got, their personalities stink. You know what I mean? We want per, I'm, a, I'm a regular fan. I don't like the Japanese. When, when, when Eddie like Guerrero wrestled, when Eddie, well, you can, okay, now that's, but see, that's racist. There you go. No, I, I, I don't like I don't like white wrestlers. Like guys that are three foot tall doing head scissors as their only move. I mean, come okay. on already. You got Ray Mysterio. What is this supposed to around. mean? He knows one move, a head scissor. Who? Ray Mysterio knows, yeah, he knows one, one move. move. And then he has this big match. See, see, see you, Mike. See you, Mike. See you, Mike. Was that Vince Russo? You, you got to do a better argument than that. Once you give Ray Mysterio knows one move, you're in, you're in a lot of trouble. Okay. This is from Jay and Pittsfield who goes, If you don't know already, I'm an avid WCW fan and I love Nitro. Wow. But I can't figure out what the hell DDP and Nash were thinking. They must be planning something with Hall, right? If Wrong. not, they, sh they shouldn't be hyping something they can't deliver. Uh, how do you guys feel about Goldberg selling the rack so well? He looked to be in a lot of pain, but it's something uh, they should have done on the pay-per-view. Agree? Uh, not necessarily. No, I, I don't think that necessarily. They, as far as the pay-per-view, though, that match oh, just sure, certainly didn't make me want to w watch a rematch. It doesn't make much sense on Thunder either for Gold Goldberg to be chasing Luger out of the building. Uh, Especially if Luger got beat clean at the last pay-per-view. Yeah, I think they want to do the whole thing of where Luger's kind of a chicken and everything. The whole Luger guy is so bad, though. Yeah, but, I mean, Goldberg is doing the streak. Nobody's beating him. And the last thing they need is him to be challenged by a guy that's afraid of him. That just got beat by him at the last pay-per-view. Well, I think the whole idea is, is that he he got heat by laying the guy out on Monday, and it's Goldberg's turn for revenge, but he runs away, so you got to wait for the pay-per-view for Goldberg to get his hands on him. Because clearly Goldberg beating him is no big deal because everyone expects it, so it's got to be... So I think Goldberg can't do anything to him until the pay-per-view. Yeah. Um, this is regarding a wrestling union. Are XFL players going to have a union? And if they are, what's Vince going to tell WF workers? I think that uh, Vince McMahon's going to work very, very hard so to make sure those XFL players don't have a union. That, that may be... If the league turns into a success, that's going to be one of many interesting things. Until the league turns into a success, the idea of those those guys now that are in the league, I don't see them... You know, forming a union because they're going to be thankful that they're, that they're able to play football and make money. Because without without the um, XFL, that I, most of these guys would either be working regular jobs or playing arena football. So they're not going to be that active in it. If the league's a success and they see the league making money, then it'll be different. And at the opening <laughs> level, they're not going to be superstars, and anybody could be, you know, just cut anybody. Uh, I think that they're never. I, I wonder how. Well, we're going to have to watch that league. It's going to be really hard for them to create superstars because, like we talked about before, and keep them. It, if a guy becomes a superstar and he's actually good, the NFL is going to take him anyway. Because there's a salary, there's a salary cap there. I mean, no one's going to be making. They're all making forty-five thousand dollar base. The top guys, you know, on the championship team will probably end up at what close to a hundred. I mean, bottom guys in the NFL make more than that. Yeah. Uh, let's see. What else do we have here? What's the condition of Booker T? How long will he be out? I know he had arthroscopic knee surgery. Uh, we also had the broken pelvis. I think the the I'm, I'm not, I don't know, um, sternum. Yeah, sternum. I'm here in two months. What are you hearing? Yeah, same thing. Okay, two months. Uh, let's see. How funny and stupid did Goldberg look when he got hit by the chair by Luger? Yeah, it was that delayed reaction. <laughs> yeah. His back is so thick that the uh, waves of pain took a full second to uh, hit his heart. 
This is from Don from Houston who goes, you mentioned earlier that things you mentioned on the show get taken into consideration by the WF the next week. I don't know if you remember, but you had a couple of emails related to the announcers being hypocrites. Well, last night, Jim Ross said the word hypocrites four times, hypocritical three times, and hypocrisy twice. <laughs> wow, someone's keeping track of that. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm, this is from Jim who goes, I'm one of the few people who has bought tickets for Starcade. Despite what I heard about the card last night, I'm still going to go. What's funny about it is my dad, who was going to be attending the show with me, let out the biggest groan I've ever heard in years when Sid Vicious came out at the end of the show. What's worse, my dad hasn't even seen him wrestle since he was Sid Justice in 1991. For my dad to remember this guy a decade after he'd last seen him about how awful a wrestler he was amazes me, but it was still good to watch it for a laugh. Ten years younger, also. Man, he's a lot worse now than he was then. Do you think Jerry Lynn will go to WF for WCW? I know he's negotiating with WF probably right as we speak. Uh, so I'd say the odds are in WF's favor. Uh, any truth to rumors of Rob Van Dam and Joey Styles going to WCW? Uh, I don't think there's any deals done that I'm aware of. Um, as far as if they want them bad enough, I would think they could get... If WCW wanted them bad enough, I think they could get both of them. I don't know. I, I shouldn't say for sure about Styles. I don't know. Van Dam, obviously... Um, if he can't get the money he wants, he's going to want to go somewhere. Uh, let's see. The only thing that that being, being talked about badly is not... The only thing worse than being talked about badly is not being talked about at all. It used to be every Tuesday morning in our dorms, we talked about Raw and Nitro. Now both shows are met with indifference. Nitro's so bad, it's just a punchline for a joke. Raw isn't bad, except for a tie, the Tiger Ali Singh match, but it's boring and tedious. You know what? How much, Brian, do you think, as far as um, boring and tedious, and how much is it just the overexposure of wrestling, so it's so difficult to do something new, so everything just seems like you've seen it already? I don't even know if it's so much overexposure now, because there really isn't that much overexposure, because I don't think a lot of people are even watching WCW right now. It's down to maybe, you know, Raw and SmackDown. You don't even have to watch Heat anymore. You don't have to watch Thunder. I don't think anyone buys w, you know, WCW pay-per-views. I kind of think that... It's. I think it's a part of it. It's just that there's no competition in WWF. It's just doing, you know, whatever. Why would Tiger Ali Singh and Steve Blackman ever be on Raw, even six months ago? I. I, I don't know. know. It's boring and tedious. But watching the show sometimes to me it's like, is this over yet? Really? I. I, I mean, I. I wasn't that bad off watching Raw. I thought it was. I thought it was a decent show. I mean, I haven't been blown away by a show in a while, but. I think a lot of the SmackDowns have been good. Last Thursdays, I didn't think was one of them, but that's another thing. Uh, this is from Dave Roebuck in Manchester, UK. This is about the Steve Regal Dynamite Kid story. Uh, and it's apparently, according to Dave, it's all Scott Hudson's fault. Uh-huh. In the UK, we have a show called WCW Worldwide, which shows clips of Nitro and Thunder, but with special UK commentary by Scott Hudson and Larry Zabisco. On an episode, Steve Regal was having a match. Halfway through the match... Scott Hudson and Larry Zbysko stopped talking about the Queen and English muffins, whatever they are, and started talking about the Wigan School. Uh, Hudson kept going on and on about the Wigan School and said that Stephen Regal was the biggin from Wigan, and he called him the greatest graduate ever from the school. He was clearly making this up as he went along. We're going to talk to Scott Hudson about this. He, he talked about the Wigan School, the Viper Pit, and said it was in the toughest part of London. Actually, it's 300 miles away from London. Anyway... <laughs> Anyway, Dynamite Kid was watching the show on television. He heard this, and he was enraged because Steve Regal never went to the snake pit, and he's been saying things about Steve Regal being a phony ever since. The entire fault is Scott Hudson for his ill-informed ad-libbing that would have made Tony Schiavone blush. As a big fan of Steve Regal, I've read and heard all of his interviews for the past eight years. He has never once, to my knowledge, claimed he ever went to the snake pit. Would you agree that he was a great wrestler? Um, this dynamite. Uh, that although this is about dynamite kid, would you agree that although dynamite kid is a great wrestler, idiotic, ill-informed comments of the past few years will be all that he's remembered for? No, dynamite kid will be remembered for yes, the fact that he was a great wrestler and that he and that he wound up in a wheelchair at a very young age, and for putting junior heavyweights for him and Satoru Sayama clearing the way for junior heavyweight wrestling. Uh, let's see what happened to Psychosis. Why have people given up on him? Don't you think? He could get to the level he was by working with Super Crazy and Tajiri. Uh, what do you think of Hector Garza? Oh, that's a couple of... Okay. Uh, I think it's mental on part of psychosis. Uh, yeah, I think that that whole... All that period Being is... Buried job, think, and just everything. All that, all that period is a jobber in WCW. sure turned him around. But, I mean, his match with, with uh, Tajiri on ECW was one of the best matches in this country all year. Mm-hmm. Uh, and But he never had another one. And, uh, and, and he had a lot of other matches that... 
and again, they weren't. None of these matches were on TV, but people were just telling me like, "Oh my God, the reason it's not on TV is because it's horrible." And you know, within a couple of weeks, they just got rid of them. Uh, let's see, what do you think of Hector Garza? Um, you know, Hector Garza is a good worker, lucha style, lucha style Latin lover. Uh, I haven't watched Latin Lover in a couple of years. Um, except, well, I've seen some clips of him. He's, you know, he's good for for what they do. Uh, Heavy Metal is a very, very gifted wrestler. He's a very good wrestler. See Bernetico, kind of a muscle guy. Um, I don't think he's that good. Shocker, Shocker's real good. Black Warrior's real good. Tarzan Boy, Tarzan Boy is like, Tarzan Boy really isn't that bad, but he gets. I remember him as a babyface at Arena Mexico, and they just hated him because he was such a pretty boy. You know, um, and it's resented him beating veterans because of because of that. Uh, this from Rob Vincent. By the way, but before I go to that, whatever happened to Chris Canyon? I think he they uh, sent him home and forgot about him. I mean, we haven't even heard his name. What the hell happened to Chris Canyon? Whatever happened to Chris Imagine Canyon? Imagine bringing else? Page back before Canyon. Whatever happened to that feud? It died. His... Oh, God. Page made uh, no mention of it. No. Uh, let's see. This is from Rob Vincent, who goes, um, he said that uh, we were talking about the Masao Kawada match in the Gonzo Bomb and said that uh, he saw a tape with El Hijo del Santo and Fuerza Guerrero where Fuerza Guerrero hit Santo with a Gonzo Bomb. On purpose or on accident? That's a good question. I don't know. I haven't, I haven't seen it. I would think it would be... I don't know. Santo and Fuerza always worked together. They've been working together for probably 12, 15 years. Mm-hmm. Okay. Do you find yourself sometimes longing for the days when you were more of a mark? Uh, you know what? It's funny. It's, I, I never I never do. Never. I don't mean from the perspective of not knowing that wrestling's a work, but from getting more emotionally involved in watching the matches. Um, no, I can't say I do. I remember in the lost days of my youth being on the edge of my seat, caring for the wrestlers when Don Morocco was hanging Ricky Steamboat. Barry Windham turned his back on the fans and joined the horsemen. I, I, I got a kick out of that angle myself. Or with the international wrestling, watching the Rougeos and the Garvins. Well, I love the Rougeos and the Garvins for the heat. You know, in those days. These days, I don't know if it's just me or the quality of the product, but I find myself a lot more detached when I'm watching wrestling. Maybe I appreciate the work a bit more, but I don't get quite the same rush of the past when I would live or die in, inside by what happened to my favorite wrestler. Do you ever find yourself longing for the same rush? I don't know. What do you think, Brian? I mean, I don't. I don't. I don't. I, I, I have I, more of a care for them personally than their the character on TV. Like, sometimes there'll be a title match, and there's a guy I think that really deserves to win the belt, you know, and he doesn't. But it's not so much like their wrestling character or anything like that. I mean, I, I don't really. I mean, I was always entertained by a guy by certain guys, and I, and I still am. Um, I mean, when Benoit was in WCW and he was getting all these title shots, I would always go, "This guy really deserves to get this belt," and he would always lose. And <laughs> that was as emotional as I got. And that has nothing to do with the character of Chris Benoit, but just this poor guy worked so hard, made everyone look so awesome. And he always got screwed. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. It's just, it's a different way of, it's just a different way of looking at things. Um, but I, I, I enjoy it. I mean, I enjoy, I enjoy a good match as much as before, and I don't enjoy a bad match as much as before. I, you know, it's, it's I don't, I don't know. I just, I, I mean, me personally, I think that there's just so much wrestling that it's hard to get up for it. You know, like when it was. When you were watching only a couple of hours a week, and or or a couple of hours of different products, like I, I, I probably watched as much wrestling, maybe even more, ten years ago. But it was less of each specific product, you know. So everything has had more of a new feel to it, or a different feel. Now there's a lot of sameness. I think the sameness is what hurts. Anyway, we are totally out of time. I want to thank Brian for being here. I want to thank Ian Hutchinson for being here, and, uh, and Violent J. And Violent J. And tomorrow we're going to have Dusty Rhodes for the first time. And that should be a lot of fun. So we'll see you all tomorrow at 6.